wow, this is not the first time I've tried to do this. And this is UFO content. This is supposed to be easy for me, but tonight I'm kind of stuck. So buckle up. Here we go. Hey there, folks. How you doing today? Welcome back to the channel. Please bear with any background racket that you might hear throughout this production. We are on location where life happens. Sometimes there's stuff going on over there that interferes with what we're trying to do in here. Also, kind of cold this evening. I'm going to keep my hands in my pockets probably through most of this just because eh, it's cold out here. Uh, if you're not familiar with the UFO content, the unfiltered fans only content, this is something that we do about once a month. It's my way of saying thanks to the loyal viewers that watch all the garbage that we produce on this platform. If you're not familiar with it, if you haven't seen one of these, we invite you to stick around. It's going to be fun. While we have had a variety of topics in our UFO content over the past couple of years, the past few episodes have been top five lists, all firearm related. This one's not going to be any different, although it will be a different topic, certainly. But it's going to be a, a gun list. It's going to be a top five. I thought about it long and hard before I put this out. So it's not just something that I pulled out of my hip pocket. This means something to me. Hopefully you'll get something out of it. Let's get right into our list. Today's top five list will be, oh, I've got notes written down over here, so I'm going to be looking down, so bear with it. Today's top five list will be things that make a gun deal a good deal. What does that even mean? What are we talking about here? Uh, this is an opinion piece, highly subjective. My thoughts based on my life experience, yours certainly might be different. Just understand, this is the stuff that I consider when I'm trying to decide whether or not a firearm purchase will be a wise or a good investment. Uh, number one on our list, initial cost. What did this thing cost me to take home? That can vary greatly depending on what the weapon is. Most of what we're going to be talking about here today is handguns, but this applies to handguns, rifles, shotguns, muzzle loaders, whatever. Uh, if you're if you're looking at something that's brand new to the market, you're probably going to be paying MSRP or maybe even north of that. You know, when I bought this Taurus GX4, which has been a very popular subject here on this channel, I purchased this about a week after they came out back in 2021, and I paid full MSRP for this pistol just to have it to play with here on the channel. In contrast, this uh, Smith & Wesson Shield Plus sitting here on the table, a buddy of mine gave me a coupon for that, and I paid about half of MSRP for that one. So why? You know, it had been out for a while already. They were trying to get rid of a surplus of them, so they gave me a really good deal. So if you're buying something that's brand new, you're going to pay a lot, generally. If you're getting something that's been out for a while, you might get a better deal on it. There's exceptions to that, but know that, uh, you know, with something to take into consideration with the initial cost, you know, am I getting a good deal out of the gate? Now, with that in mind, when you get that good deal out of the gate, Sometimes it's not as good of a deal as you might have thought it was. We'll cover that more on the other steps. But just know that because you got it at a lower than MSRP price right out of the gate, that doesn't make it the best deal that it could have been. Uh, moving on, let's see. Number two, number two on our list will be the cost to feed it. If you consider a gun to be a pet, the rest of this list will make a lot more sense. You know, if you've got, you know, some kind of little 20 pound stray dog that comes up and hangs out at your place and it'll eat whatever you give it and it seems to do fine, eh, you know, cost of ownership might not be that much. Whereas if you have a horse with a sensitive stomach, the cost can be a lot greater. So you have to take into consideration how much is it going to cost me to feed this thing. Getting back to actual guns and, and away from the pets. You know, these two pistols are nine millimeters. Most nine millimeter pistols will function fairly well with most nine millimeter ammo, which means that 
your target ammunition is going to be reasonably priced. Your defensive ammunition is going to be reasonably priced for most 9 millimeter pistols. In contrast, this 40 cal, this uh, 10 millimeter here, my 357 that you see back over my shoulder here, it's going to cost you twice as much to shoot any of those as either one of these 9 millimeters. So just know it's like, I want a 45 or I want a 10 millimeter. Great. You're going to pay to feed it. So you have to keep that in mind when it comes to is this purchase a good deal? Uh, let's see, moving on. Number three on my list is the cost to clothe it. Well, what does that mean? Guns don't wear clothes. Oh, but they wear holsters. And if you purchase something like this Shield Plus, the Shield Plus will fit in a shield holster and shields have been out for a long time. And just about everybody makes a couple of options for a holster for a Shield Plus. So you could probably find a good holster and not pay a lot for it with the shield versus say... You know, we'll use this one as an example. This is a Glock 3 pattern pistol, but it will not fit in a Glock holster for a variety of reasons. The, the front rail here is too thick. There's dimensionally, it's not the same as a Glock. And while you can find a holster for something like that, it's going to require more work and more effort, and you might wind up paying a little more for it than you would just some Amazon special Glock 19 holster. Same thing applies to the PSA dagger here. The slide is taller than it is on a Glock 19. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. If you buy something obscure or something that's not real mainstream just to save a couple of bucks, you might wind up eating it on the holster. My uh, Canik uh, MC9 up there at the top came with its holster, and it's actually a pretty good one. So that's something to consider, too. Does the gun come with a holster? Especially if you're buying something used. Somebody's making you a good deal because they need to pay their rent. Hey, I got this gun. I want this much for it. It's like, do you have a holster for it? You know, normally they'll throw it in for another 20 bucks or whatever. So keep that in mind. All right, next. Let's see. Number four on our list. Does it need glasses? What you talking about, Willis? All right. Does your firearm need glasses? Are the sights that came on your gun adequate or are you going to have to spend money to make them better? Back to the Shield Plus here. We've got uh, tritium three dot sights. The back ones are blacked out. The front one's orange. Pretty good setup. These aren't the brightest tritium sights, but realistically, this little gun is perfectly good out the gate with the sights that came on it. By contrast, uh, we'll come back over here to our Taurus uh, GX4, which came with a white dot front sight and a blacked out serrated rear sight. Pretty good, but on a defensive handgun, I say night sights are pretty much mandatory. If you don't have night sights, you got to have a flashlight or something so you can see what you're aiming it at if you're using it in low light conditions. You know, Glock pistols notoriously have terrible sights from the factory. If you get the Glock factory night sights, they're not bad, but they're not good. Glocks were made with the intention of somebody's going to beat these plastic sights out of this thing and put something else on it. So that's what I'm getting at there. Does the gun come with the sights you're going to keep on it, or are you going to have to spend money on sight? Just know that not everybody makes sights for the Canik. The Walther PDP over there takes Glock sights, so everybody makes sights for that one. So it's, it's just something that you, have to, that you have to think about. All right, so our honorable mention for this list. All the millennials out there tell me you have to have an honorable mention on a top five list. So our honorable mention is, does it need something else to make it run right? What do we mean by that? It's like, well, I bought this gun. I bought this Savage Axis. And the trigger is so bad that I have to spend money to fix the trigger. Or I bought this Savage Axis and the crappy plastic stock is so bad that I had to spend money to replace the stock. And, you know, I'm, I'm picking on the Savage Axis. It's a wonderful platform. It really is a good gun. But... 
you know, if you're serious about trying to get one whole groups or little bitty groups at 100 yards with your bolt action rifle, you're probably going to have to make some changes. Or by contrast, you might spend just a little bit more and get a rifle that doesn't need it. Uh, the Stevens 334 that we have here was pretty good out of the gate. Granted, it did not have glasses on it. We had to supply those. And the trigger was a little heavy. More on that later. This trigger has been adjusted down now to where it is really good. That came at a cost. I had to pull that video for another reason. We're going to put it back out in the very near future, maybe even this week. But just know that the, the cost of ownership, the cost of is it a good deal, includes am I going to have to do something to it to make it run right. Number five on our list, and this one is a real biggie, and some of you guys are going to argue this one. Um, does it have a good warranty plan? What do we mean by that? Well, most firearm manufacturers have what's called a limited lifetime warranty on their weapons. Most limiting to that lifetime warranty is most manufacturers say that the lifetime warranty is limited to the original purchaser of that weapon. There are a couple of exceptions to it, but just know that on paper, that is the limitation to a lifetime warranty pretty much across the board in the firearm world. I think. The most notable exception to that would be High Point. High Point has a little, pretty much a no questions asked lifetime warranty. We've actually had that one back at the shop a couple of times. High Point was great about it. They literally changed all the parts in that gun and made it run right. So, you know, by contrast, Taurus limits their lifetime warranty to the original purchaser. Smith & Wesson, SIG, you know, this is a $1,500 gun new. No, they're, once you transfer it to somebody else, they're no longer held to that lifetime warranty. That being said, the firearm industry in general is usually very good about honoring warranty claims, even if you're not the first purchaser. I think a lot of it has to do with the liabilities associated with a firearm purchase. But I personally have purchased guns used that had issues. And when I reached out to the manufacturer about it, the most common thing that you hear from them is send it to us. Let us have a look at it. They want to do that so that they can verify that this thing is not going to blow up in your hand. That's really what it comes down to. I've had secondhand Ruger weapons that just didn't run. Hey, be quiet over there. I've had secondhand Ruger weapons that just didn't run right. You send it back to the manufacturer. I, I bought a Ruger pistol one time, secondhand, that did not work right. I sent it back to Ruger and they mailed me a brand new gun. So it does happen. Uh, I'm not saying that'll happen for you. Don't get any wild ideas, but there are extremes to things. And the firearm industry as a whole is usually very good at honoring warranties. But let's broaden that a little bit now. I purchased a, an old Taurus Model 85 revolver for little of nothing. And while it's a fun range toy, it has a timing issue that occasionally causes it not to... Uh, not to hit the primer when the cylinder rotates around in double action shooting. If you cock the hammer first, it fires every time, but sometimes the hammer just doesn't rebound hard enough to set it off. Probably a spring issue, possibly a timing issue. The lockup on it is still pretty good. That division of Taurus, you're talking about from like the late 80s, early 90s. This is an old gun doesn't really exist anymore. Even back in the day when it did, they didn't have lifetime warranties on them. So on that one, I'm probably either going to have to try to fix it myself or get somebody to fix it. But, you know, this pistol, this pistol, with the exception of that guy, any of those pistols, if I needed to have it repaired by the factory, 
they probably would do it even if I was not the original purchaser on it. But just know that that's something to consider. So, you know, you might you might find a gun that's fifty dollars, a hundred dollars cheaper than a different one, but it might be kind of a weird design and not have readily accessible holsters, or there might not be the aftermarket support for replacement sights, or there might be replacement sights available, but because it's some kind of fringe platform, you might wind up paying two or three times for the night sights or the replacement sights that you would for a Glock or a Smith and Wesson. So. Those are the kind of things that you have to think about when you're deciding if the purchase as a whole is going to be a good deal. Also, um, you know, how many rounds am I going to have to fire through this thing to break it in? That high point that I just pulled up and showed you, we put more ammunition through it than the gun was worth trying to get it right. Eventually sent it back to high point. They fixed it. Now it runs okay. It still doesn't run perfect. It might run better after another couple hundred rounds, but realistically, it was bought for a video, so we're probably not going to put those rounds through it here. By contrast, you know, this little Glock 26 right here has been nearly perfect the entire time that I've owned it. Uh, you can limp wrist a 26 if you're not careful. I've done that before just because it's kind of hard to hold on to, and every once in a while, you get a little bit of flip in it that you didn't intend and it might not cycle completely, but by far and large, if you're doing what you're supposed to with it, this pistol will run like a scalded cat. This one was put together out of a parts kit, and it was a little rough at the beginning. After a couple of boxes, it got to where it was functioning like it's supposed to, but it still doesn't feel good. It probably still needs a little work to make it reliable, you know, or smooth at least. Whereas this P226 Legion, I mean, it, it fires like a well-broken-in gun every time you pull the trigger. Also, if you're buying used guns, you know, how much are you paying for it in relation to what it originally sold for? I actually purchased this 226 second hand from a guy that was needing to, uh, he needed money. And the price he offered it to me for, I couldn't say no. It was the deal of a century. I got a very, very, very good deal on that gun. So, you know, I, I picked it. It, it was, this was actually one of the best deals that I've made in the last couple of years on a firearm acquisition. And that kind of brings me back to why I have these two guns out here. Out of all of my guns, I sit these two up here because they're both fairly recent acquisitions within the last year or two. And out of all the guns that I've got, I have to say that they were both probably a couple of the best deals that I've made. So, you know, again, a good deal is subjective. A good deal means something different to me than what it means to you. To me, a Glock 19 at MSRP is probably a good deal in the fact that the sights are going to be cheaper, the holster is going to be cheaper, parts are going to be readily available. If I need to send it in for a warranty claim, Glock's going to fix it. And, you know, if I want to change a part on it to make it run better or faster somewhere down the line, everybody makes parts for a Glock. So those are just, you know, things you have to think about when it comes to uh, whether or not it's going to be a good deal. Now I'd like to know what you think about whether or not it's going to be a good deal. You know, let me know down below what you think. Let me know if this video was good or if it was nonsense and you want me to stop doing videos like this. Let me know. I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, take care. God bless.